We're live, Russell. OK, right. Thanks very much. Well, good afternoon, everyone. And can I welcome you to the uh, planning committee meeting? Uh, do we have apologies for absence, please? Got apologies from Councillor Hardy. OK. Councillor Johnson? Uh, uh, from Councillor Alexander. OK, thanks. And you've already noted, uh, Janet, that Councillor Wallace will have to have to leave. Yes, okay. thank you. Right, thanks very much indeed. That then takes us on to the order of business, which was going to be changed, but doesn't need to be changed now. So the order of business is as per the agenda. That takes us on to declarations of interest. Is there anybody uh, has an interest? Councillor Munro. Uh, it's Councillor Smale. Well, really, Councillor Smale, right, Smale, right OK. Sorry. I have the, an interest in the uh, or connection re relative to the final item on, regarding the Pathhead development, and I'll recuse myself from that. OK, thank you very much. Is there anyone else has an interest to declare? If, if not, just remember that you can declare an interest at the item if something comes across uh, that you remember you shouldn't perhaps be participating. Right, thank you very much. Takes us on to the minutes of the last meeting for your approval. Are they approved as the correct record? They have been circulated. I haven't received any comments, so I'm going to assume that they're OK with everybody. Is that OK? Thanks very much. Then takes us on to public reports. Now, can I just say, uh, for the benefit of Councillor McKenzie, as, as well as the, the rest of the members, there's an expectation, because we're in lockdown, and we're, we're, we're on the flat screen that we have supposed to have read all the reports. So the, the, I will be saying the report is taken as read, open it up for questions, but Peter is obviously here to answer any questions that members have. So therefore, we move on to item 5.1, which is the National Planning Framework. Again, I'm going to take that report as read. Um, could I just open it up for any members that have any questions? Oh, Councillor Hackett, sorry. That's all right. Thank you, Chair. I was looking at hands coming up there and it came up the other on the on the screen. Sorry. No worries. Um, I'm just wondering if this report offers an opportunity to say something about the infrastructure that supports housing development. And our councillors will know a lot of the comments with the rate of house building. We get lots of comments around GP practices, roads, other infrastructure, community facilities. And I'm wondering if this uh, re this consultation offers an opportunity for the council to say something about that when the Scottish government's looking at housing supply across the country, particularly as the fastest growing local authority in the country. And I'd be interested in your view in particular, Chair, and, and perhaps the planning managers as well. Thank you. <coughs> thanks, thanks very much, Councillor Arca. There is something in the in the, in the the document that actually uh, mentions about infrastructure, etc., adequate infrastructure, but I'll, I'll pass it on to Peter uh, for more in-depth uh, response on that. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, the response does pick up the need for infrastructure, and that is a, a really key, important component of, of this going forward. And I understand the sort of sentiment of the communities about the feeling that the House house building rate and other development rate is is advancing quicker than infrastructure can keep up with it. And it's often the case because that infrastructure is funded or part funded from the development. So you need to almost take the development and get off the ground first and then the infrastructure follows. So it always feels like you're playing catch up. As part of the 2019 planning act, the Scottish Government have identified that as, a, as actually an issue. And there is discussion about a, a way in which we could try and move that around so the infrastructure comes first and the Scottish Government have started talking about infrastructure first. But to make that happen, it involves quite significant financial investment, either from central government or somehow through local authorities, maybe front loaded borrowing. But there isn't any detail on that. So I, all I'm saying really is that everyone seems to be mindful of that now. That seems to be a recognised issue, um, but there's no solution to that just yet. But in terms of our draft response to go back to the Scottish Government in terms of the housing numbers. We've obviously flagged up the implication of 
of delivering housing is obviously the impact on infrastructure. So we have identified that, but the, the point is well made and it's one that is uh, quite commonly said. Yeah. Okay, Councillor Harker. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Would you mind if I had a follow up? If that's okay. Yes, of course. Thank you. And since my time as a councillor and before that, often, you know, the rate of house building that we're seeing here in Midlothian and, and other parts of the east of Scotland, it's been explained to me as the economy moving um, from west to east. It's the reduction of the manufacturing sector and the increase in, you know, the knowledge sector and service sector. And again, I'm just wondering, um, in terms of the national debate, national discussion around that, is that featuring as part of that consultation? Is there something there that Midlothian could be saying with other local authorities in the area? Um, again, because if the, the, the reason for the change is economic drivers, it's not then also about housing. There's all the other employment sites and everything else that would have to go along with that. And again, I'm just wondering if that's featuring as part of both our submission and also the, the national discussion. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. It's certainly been picked up, uh, Councillor Hackett, through the City Region Deal uh, Committee. Um, there's clearly um, an acknowledgement that the southeast of Scotland is actually the economic driver for the rest of Scotland. And it's also um, the Oversight Committee, which is a kind of elected members committee of the City Region Deal Committee, are looking at the various uh, avenues that may be open to us to uh, pool money in to recognise that this is a growth area and get government both uh, in Scotland and indeed in the UK to actually recognise that this is a growth area and put all the necessary uh, bits of infrastructure uh, in place so that we can actually deal with what's coming our way. So yes, there is there, are, there has been certainly talk about that. At the end of the day, whether whether that will come to anything, goodness only knows. But we, we can't, we won't get stopped for trying, Councillor Hackett. Councillor Cassidy. Yeah, thank you, Chair. And just following on from Councillor Hackett's point there, is there any way we as a local authority can put more pressure on the Scottish Government to come to the table and start playing uh, the game here? Because this is one of the, the biggest uh, feedback you get from our local communities is about the infrastructure is absolutely non-existent for these new estates. And you cross the boundary into Edinburgh, the new houses that they're building there all have to have shops at the bottom of the tower blocks and, you know, their, their flats. Why can't we put a bit of pressure on that we have the same legislation or the powers to do that? Certainly, it's certainly something we could look at. It might be an additional recommendation, Councillor Cassidy, that you get me to get in touch with the appropriate minister once the cabinet's in place, the new cabinet's in place. I don't mind making uh, making representation uh, from a planning perspective, planning and stroke economic development perspective on behalf of the council. It's not a problem, and I'm, if the committee endorsed that, more than happy happy to do so because I do think we have got to continue to keep the pressure up because I think you're you're absolutely right, Councillor Cassidy. We can we can talk about it in in a vacuum. Uh, amongst a planning committee within Midlothian Council, but the reality is that we have not got the wherewithal financially to actually uh, pump start that uh, that infrastructure build. So quite happy if the committee are if the committee are happy to do so is to add that as an extra recommendation. But first of all, to uh, agree the recommendations in the paper that we actually send our responses back to Scottish Government, and we can take that up as a separate uh, action point. If you're quite that happy with like that. A plan. Yep. Okay, thanks. Councillor Hackett. Sorry to hog the meeting, Chair. Um, I would in second that uh, contribution from Councillor Cassidy. And, and if I may, I would also add the issue of how funding for the council, the police service, the NHS, it's often based on population figures. And we've seen to our own detriment, um, you know, the 11.40 hours, for example, where, you know, we missed out and I think it was around 25% of our funding. And that was down to the population figures that are used. So it's not just about the council, it's all the services and it's how those <coughs> figures are then used to determine um, Scottish government spend. So um, not to cross over what Councillor Cassidy was saying, but if we could add that into the mixture as well, because that obviously has an impact on the resources available to deliver local services to uh, support the growing community as well. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for that. Message received and understood. 
OK, so can we agree the recommendations with that additional uh, action point? Is that OK? Right, thanks very much indeed. That then takes us on to uh, 5.2, which is the tree preservation order at Golf Course Road. Again, I'm taking it as red. That's now back for us. It's been out round the round, <laughs> round the houses, round the trees, should I say? And it's it's back here for for endorsement. So could we just endorse that uh, today? Is that agreed? Okay, right. Thank you. Another TPO um, is at uh, Eight Ancrum Road, Dalkeith. Again, it's just to extend what was a TPO area. Uh, to make sure that the oak tree that was actually subject to condition in a planning application uh, that was to be retained is not cut down before they enact the planning uh, permission. So uh, it's just, again, us, uh, us doing our, our due, due diligence and ensuring that the oak tree, which is a mature oak tree, uh, remains. Is that agreed as well? To go forward on that? Right, thank you very much. Sorry. Um, oh, sorry, um, sorry, sorry, sorry. Councillor sorry, Councillor um, Johnson, I didn't. I, I should have been looking at hands that are underneath the screen as well. Okay, thank you. I just was looking for a bit uh, more information because when I, I haven't been to the street to look at this tree, but I did see that it, it looked like it was hanging over. It looked to me like it could be dangerous. It's awfully near the, the wall. It's causing damage. Can you explain to me why it's important that a tree that's causing so much damage and could injure someone as to have a preservation order stay on it? Well, the, there was a planning application for an extension to the house and a driveway, etc. came up, Councillor Johnson, and one of the conditions on it was to retrain that tree. The difficulty about that is they can then go and cut the thing down prior to enacting any planning permission, which is a a way of uh, circumventing a condition that was put on, but Peter's probably a lot more affair with that than, than I am. Peter. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, yeah in, terms, in terms of the paperwork, Chair, it does set out the position that in terms of the consultation in which we undertook, the owner uh, appointed some specialists to look at this issue in terms of the tree and its relationship to the wall, and they identified that there clearly is an issue in terms of the proximity of the tree and the wall, but the the damage and therefore the risk is quite minimum at the moment, but it's potentially an issue later on. So the recommendation is actually saying that although we want to confirm the tree preservation order, we're prepared to look at it again in 10 years time. And that 10 years is based on what the applicant's orbiculturist has identified is that it's got another 10 or 20 years of growth in this before it causes a, a particular risk or hazard. So we we'll accept that at some point in the distant future or in the future, there comes a time when that tree may have to come out, but we just don't think that's for now. And that's based on the amenity value, climate change value, and obviously biodiversity value. It is a mature oak tree. Oak trees have particularly high benefits in terms of climate change, biodiversity, and amenity value. It's in a conservation area where mature trees are part of that character, so it's got that value to it. So that's that's why we've made a recommendation to confirm the TPO, but have recognised that, that down the line we'll have to review that. Thank you. OK, fine. Councillor Cassidy. Yeah, could I just ask Peter, was there a health and safety uh, report done on the tree that it's it's going to it is going to stand up because it does look at a pretty jaunty angle to me when I look at the pictures of it. Uh, the there was an arboriculturist looked at it and a structural engineer looked at this because of obviously the wall and we internally had building standards officers look at it as well because of the structure of the wall. So the the health and safety issue is being identified by the applicant as a concern that if the tree continues to expand and grow. It may undermine the wall. The wall then becomes unstable and the risk is actually does the wall then fall over and obviously impact someone if someone's stood by it when it when it falls. So that's the, the risk here. But that's why I'm saying that that risk is a real one. I accept that, but it's not an immediate one. That's that's maybe 10 years down the line. So that's why we've taken a slightly unusual approach to it. But in terms of health and safety, that's the implication. The health and safety issue isn't from 
the instability of a tree. So the tree may fall, it's the tree growing and impacting the wall. OK. Right, so can we endorse that report? Councillor Hackett. Sorry, Chair, just, and I, I know, I think I know the answer to this, obviously, but if, if the tree were to grow a lot over the next 10 years and perhaps needed to be revisited earlier, the, the property owner has a right to do that. That's correct, Chair. Yeah. OK. All right, OK, that then takes us on to the pre planning application uh, for South Mayfield. Again, I'm taking it as the paper has papers have been read and I'll open it up for any questions that anybody may have. Is that <laughs> Councillor Smale, I'm assuming that that's you trying to just you're on mute. OK, yeah, th thank you very much uh, for the work that's gone, gone into this. Obviously, extensive discussions at Mayfield and East Houses Community Council about this, and I'm sure uh, also in Newton Grange. Um, just a, a, a couple of points that, that rise to the surface. Uh, this has been in the, the works, I understand, for almost 18 years and is zoned, so that our chances of uh, turning it down uh, entirely uh, appear to be very low. So it's a question of optimising the shape of it and then also possibly the Section 75 arrangements. The obvious problem that I see as a councillor for the area is that uh, the uh, industrial estate is actually very noisy. We've already had complaints from people uh, living in uh, the south side of Mayfield. So if we build houses close to the uh, NWH and, and other uh, 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 operations, there's going to be, I think, a, a definite sign problem, and I think that ought to be something that's resolved early on in the development of the plan here. Uh, the second point that's been made is that most of the traffic from this development will flow towards the Crawleys Road, which definitely needs a rebuild, it's in a very bad state, and then eventually drop down to the A7 near the Mining Museum. Now that junction is already problematic, and I think we need early days to have a proper survey of what the extra demand for traffic is going to do there. Uh, th the third thing, which is a rather smaller point, uh, Councillor Munro and myself, and uh, following on from Newton Grange uh, voices, have argued that the uh, old coal railway line that forms the western uh, divide between Newton Grange and, and these sites, that's ideal for development as a safe route to school, as a cycle path, and uh, I think that also should, would, would probably result in some reconfiguration of the houses in the, the Suttis Lee areas. So I make these, these three points, uh, having listened to the community council, as I think we're all entitled to do. Thank you. Well, thanks very much indeed. Uh, Councillor Johnson. Uh, thank you very much. I had a couple of inquiries, um, but the fact is it's almost going to be a village in itself um, because of the volume of um, uh, units that are to be built. And I wanted to ensure that there would be adequate road safety testing to make sure people can get in and out and also that there was walking facilities available. And given that it's going to be such a big thing, I wondered what, um, I know it comes under Section 75, but I want to make sure that there will be enough public uh, facilities. Will there, for example, will there be a park a substantial park for people to congregate and socialise and children to play in. And then obviously the other things uh, to accommodate the population growth uh, for uh, infrastructure. Thank you. Thanks very much, Councillor Johnson. Councillor Muirhead. <coughs> Sorry, Chair, I thought you were, um, somebody would be responding to, to, to Carthia. No, I, I have got a, right. remember this is a pre, yeah. pre application right. and, and okay. what's said is minuted and it then mm. gets taken into consideration. Mm. So you're mm. not uh, we're not making a decision today. Sorry. No. Right. I mean go go on way I, I can recall this being discussed when I first went on the council eighteen years ago. Um because that is when it was um it, it was included in the structure plan at that time. Um and it's clear at that point that the Crawleys, as we know it, where it's double bend and things like that, would be straightened out, and they there would be another road introduced that linked halfway along the Crawleys, in effect, and up to the end of 
a, the extension sort of Bogwood Road, would that be right? You know, where it just came straight through big wide, a reasonably wide road. So that side of it, um, I think, is probably going to be covered. Like um, Councillor Johnson's point, uh, I, I, I think that uh, you know we need to make sure that there are, are good routes through this est these estates for um, access to schools, etc. For getting across with, with cycling, walking, and, and and things like that. I, I, I think also we should be looking for clear distinctions between communities. I, I understand what's being said there is a potential, mostly a, a new community here, but I think, you know, gateway signage, things like that, go, you know, you're now in and Gore Bridge, for example, and um, some gaps between the, the, the houses within this, the, 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 uh, uh, this new area and the lights say Gouts Hill and things like that. So there are clear distinctions that you are now going from one community into another to try to to maintain the, the identities of your communities. I think these sorts of things are, are, are really important. It's a sizable number of houses and I recall um, some time ago um, things kind of ground to a halt in Midlothian regarding the um, availability of water supply and drainage and things like that. I, I presume that um, the facilities that we that were put in place then up at the camp, you know, uh, with the water supply will still be adequate to service this amount of uh, new housing. Uh, just just so I make a comment on that. But the one sort of main thing I want to 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 raise is there's no mention in here at all of the impact on um, medical facilities, doctor surgeries. We all know that we're, we're kind of straining uh, at the moment in both Gorebridge and at New Battle in terms of people being able to get appointments. And, and nowhere in this, in any of the things, can I see any reference to, you know, we talk about making sure that there's enough um, leisure facilities, education facilities, and roads infrastructure, etc. Nothing at all about... Um, uh, GP practices or anything like that. Um, I just, I just wondered if you, you know that that that's something that needs to. We obviously need to address. Um, we'll just make that point. Thanks, Chair. No, thanks, Councillor Head. Councillor Hackett. Thank you, Chair. Just to echo those comments about coalescence of communities, I think it's important that um, Mayfield, Newton Grange, uh, Gore Bridge, and Gaux Hill maintain their identity. Um, that's really crucial. Um, one of the other comments that's been raised with me that I would agree with as well is making sure that if there is affordable housing allocated that it's not all lumped into one site, it's scattered throughout the site and integrated with other housing. Um, again, echo the comments about the GP practices as well. Um, and making sure, one of the comments I've had feedback from residents was that the developer was talking about, well, because of this 20 minute neighbourhood um, proposal, all the shops that currently exist in Newton Grange and Mayfield and other areas are within 20 minutes distance of this new development. And I think my interpretation of that, that would be a little bit of a twisting of the purpose or the meaning of this 20 minute neighbourhood and that I would encourage the developer to provide, um, you know, small shops, etc. similar along the lines that uh, Cassidy was talking about earlier on the previous agenda item. Thank you. Okay, thanks for that. And uh, Councillor Mackenzie. Thank you, Chair. Um, I would echo points that both Jim and John had mentioned there. Um, when we talk about the distinct shape of the communities, I'd like to hope that the developer does something with regards to the individual units themselves. So obviously Newton Grange has very distinctive properties with the, the traditional brick built. And that perhaps looks different from Mayfield, which again looks different from Gaux Hill. I think it'd be fantastic if the developer reflected that in the units. Um, I'd also say about the access roads. Um, hopefully there's been quite a lot of consideration taken on how that's going to affect the traffic flow. Certainly if you've stood on those roads that um, abut that area at peak times, it's a constant stream of traffic already. So I'd be interested to see how the developer likes to blend that into the existing traffic. OK, right. Thanks very much. Uh, Peter, it's all right. I'm going to bring you in just now. Don't think you were getting away with it. Um, right, Peter, look, could you just 
uh, answer some of those points and indeed um, obviously take a, take account of them for the minute. But also, uh, Councillor Johnson has put in the chat about the, the old railway n maybe not being suitable for, for a, a, a route to school. So could you maybe just cover that off as well if you're, if you've, if you're able to? Thanks. Thanks, Chair. I mean, just to start with that, I'm not 100% sure whether that is an option that we could use. So that would involve a bit of investigation. So I won't answer that directly, whether that can be used. I'd have to go away and look into that. I suppose the starting point for me, Chair, was just to actually say all the issues that all the elected members raised were all good planning considerations. So they can all be issues which are taken forward with the developer. So they're all valid on in that regard. I suppose ticking off some of the issues that jump out, just to, to reaffirm um, for Councillor Muirhead, is that yes, some of the water and drainage issues have been addressed in terms of capacity so that this site can come forward in a particular form. Um, the second thing I was just going to pick up from the list was going back to the GPs issue, which is you, you do hear this a lot. And in terms of the planning system, if there's identified shortfall of facilities, and I'm talking bricks and mortar, then developer contributions can be taken towards the provision of the built facility. But the issue often is a shortage of GPs, nurses, other medical staff. And that's the bit, of course, the planning system can't can't resolve and, and can't address. We do liaise with uh, obviously colleagues internally and NHS Lothians in terms of the scale of development and growth. So we do try to, to pre-inform them where growth is going to take place so they can also align their, their plans with us. Um, one of the other things I was just going to pick up is that, um, yes, there will be a transport assessment as part of the planning application because there was an historical commitment which is still valid today to improve the road infrastructure so that is definitely fundamental to this this scheme there's also a recognition that there's potential noise disruption from the mayfield industrial estate and that's why in the earlier um, proposals and earlier discussions it was seen that there would be a sort of landscape buffering around the mayfield industrial estate and you wouldn't have residential development right up close to it um, for those members that have been on the, the council longer than me, some of you might remember we actually refused a housing scheme for this site as well. I think it was in 2008 um, because there was an earlier proposal for well over a thousand units, but the, the form and density of the development was such that it just did not provide a nice amenity for future residents or existing residents. So it's just to, to make the point. So although there is a fundamental principle in favour of this development because it is allocated, it doesn't automatically mean you have to just accept anything. And this council didn't accept a really poor design back in 2008. And that's going back in time, but well, that's where we are. The, the landowners have changed, the companies have evolved, and the new house builders are aware of the history and are, um, have an understanding of a lot of the issues that have been identified. So hopefully they will be, will be addressed as we go forward. But I've made a, a detailed list of all those items, Chair. We can take those away and put those... Uh, into the discussions of the developers. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Peter. Councillor Cassidy. Thank you, Chair. I, I'd just like to ask a quick uh, question here. Is the, we give permission to this estate, well, we'll, we'll have to give permission. When uh, the, this was first muted, I don't think that uh, Neil Williams' recycling plant was on that site. Now, things have changed uh, dramatically. I think that site works 24 hours a day. So where are we going to stand legally when uh, constituents come to us and say, we want this change, we want this uh, noise stopped, uh, we can't sleep at night? Are we making a rod for our own back or for future councillors' backs here that they're going to have a mess to clean up with us? I'll Chair. take Councillor Smale before I bring you before I bring you and I'll take Councillor Smale and then I'll take Mr. Torpy. It's the old switch you're again, Mr. Chairman. It's uh, uh Ken Monroe this time. Um just Roberta... <laughs> sorry, sorry, it's just that right, okay. <laughs> sorry, we're sharing a laptop and these things happen when we share a laptop. 
Um, just going back to the cycle path that we, um, the province briefly mentioned a minute ago, um, for Jim and Kathy, I know the local geography, it's actually off Lothian Terrace. If they'll know that one side of Lothian Terrace is just a fence right behind there. Uh, Peter, who you might not know the local geography, it's the old uh, railway line from I don't know how long ago. Nature's very much taken over, but the province and I went to go and have a look at it. And what we'd like to get out of this development um, is uh, something akin to what used to ha have behind Tesco's Harding Green when that uh, cycle path, um, something along those lines. If Peter, if you would like to join uh, Councillor Muirhead and Johnston and I at some point, uh, maybe we could take that offline and see what uh, dates we can maybe uh, catch up and have a look at that in person, along with the provost is already very much active on the case. Thank you. Well, that'll be very helpful, Councillor Road. I'm sure, sure Peter will look forward to getting being allowed to get out again. Um, Mr. Turpey. Thank you, Chair. This is probably the point at which I wish I had someone else I could swap around with to answer the more difficult <laughs> Well, you're on camera, so get on yeah. with it. And I may need to, I'll refer to anything that Peter Arnsdorf comes in on as well. But yeah, I think it's a, it's a valid point that's been made that the old rule about coming to a nuisance went back in the 1980s with the uh, Edinburgh Tattoo case. And yeah, as Councillor Cassidy has pointed out, if we grant permission for this, which if it's in terms of the planning proposals, then we have to do so. Um, there is a possibility that we will subsequently have someone who's moved into a house next to a recycling plant complaining that they're next to a recycling plant was there when they moved in. Um, I suppose all we can do is look to whether, and uh, this is where I'll defer to Peter, is whether there are noise mitigation measures that can be added to the planning conditions to try and resolve that matter, to have landscaping and the tweet there so that the houses aren't cheap by jowl with the plant, but uh, I say I'll have to defer to Peter on that one. Right, before I bring Peter in, I've got Councillor Hackett and uh, Councillor Corn. Thank you, Chair. I just I made a, a note on the chat there about sewage overflow. The sewage is often expelled into the ESC, and it's just to make sure that this development doesn't contribute any further to that problem, if that's at all possible. Thank you. OK, thanks for that, Councillor Hackett. Councillor Corn. Thanks, Chair. I did raise uh, this issue around the noise. Um, new residents coming in um, where there might be existing noise. I remember raising this previously with an issue in Dander Hall and Peter mentioned something about agent of change. So just wondering if you could comment on that. OK, right, thanks. Right, Peter. OK, yeah, it's in terms of the, the noise, um, local residents have certain rights in terms of noise and amenity and you can make complaints about noise and if there's a statutory noise nuisance obviously the council can use its its powers in that regard to try to address that that nuisance what the agent of change has said to to the local authorities is that when you have new development coming forward like this one that cannot then come into a site and place an unreasonable burden on an already existing business so an existing business has a degree of protection and it's the housing scheme in this case the new development that should mitigate against that noise rather than just move new residents in and then they in the future potentially make noise nuisance complaints which impacts the business so the consequence of that is that you need a number of factors take place one is a degree of physical separation between new build and a noise nuisance. You have noise mitigation measures in terms of uh, in terms of the orientation of buildings, in terms of the double stroke triple glazing which can be put into new buildings and you can have other noise attenuation measures in particular noise attenuation fencing where sometimes you see low level bunding with fencing above it. So in terms of the developer in this case they would have to take cognizance of the fact that you have an existing operating industrial estate um, to the north of it and it will have to make sure that future residential properties are, are mitigated against those noise nuisance. It's quite interesting when if you look back at the the, the uh, past here, this site was originally allocated in or part of the site was originally allocated in the 2003 local plan. 
It was then reinforced in the 2008 and 2017 plan. Because of that time period, it's quite interesting because we've been saying that the plan authorities do, when they review their local development plans, have the option to take schemes, uh, sites out of it if they have not come forward. It's called deallocating sites. So as well as allocating housing sites, you can deallocate them if they have not come forward for, for housing. And the last time when we went through the local plan process, we did, I won't use the word threaten, but there was a there was basically a, a direction to that that the then house builder that that you can't keep doing this in terms of not developing this site, and it simply just goes on and on and on with uncertainty. So I think this is bringing this to a head in terms of the new owners are, are wanting to move this this site forward. I think the Neil Williams uh, Recycling Centre, when I started here in two thousand seven had a series of temporary permissions which have evolved and have been formed into a, a permanent position. So I think Councillor Cassidy might be right insofar as when you go back to the 2003 local plan, the status of, of not just Neil Williams but some of the other businesses on the business park was different. So the situation is evolving all the time. But on the basis that there isn't a grant of planning permission yet, the developer coming forward has to take on board the current situation. So they'll have to reflect the fact that there is these businesses at, uh, at the Mayfield Industrial Estate. Hopefully that helps, Chair. Right, thanks, Peter. OK, well, you've heard that all the comments that have been made will be taken uh, into consideration by the planning department when they meet with the uh, developers and, and obviously if it does come forward, it will come back to us as a planning committee uh, for determination. So, um, you know, all all the points that have been made uh, will actually be taken into account. Sorry, Councillor McKenzie. Thank you, Chair. Uh, one additional point, if I could. Obviously, in the last 12 months, we've all learned an awful lot more about broadband connectivity. Um, could we get an assurance from the developer that they put in as a high spec broadband as they could, as they can? Yeah, we we already have that as part of our our policy within uh, with within the uh, the not the local plan. It was actually a supplementary piece of uh, documentation. So you're right to to raise the point, Councillor McKenzie, and uh, the developers are having to put in uh, telecoms. Uh, connections into houses anyway so uh, we we have insisted that they put broadband in in there hopefully as, as high speed as we possibly can although one wonders how high speed how spy, high speed is now coping with everybody working from home but that's uh, that's sorry that's an aside i shouldn't be but yes we will that will be taken into consideration and it will be part of a planning condition if and when the, the a detailed application comes forward but thanks Thank for raising you. anyway OK, oops, Councillor Curran and then Councillor Muirhead. Sorry, just on a technical point. I'm just looking at the boundary for the development area. It seems to take in the north side of Gauss Hill Crescent. You know, other than the obvious development impact, is there any other impact for the, the residents, uh, existing residents here? Yeah, Jay. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, I've just, I just noticed that the boundary overlaps those residential properties. I'll, I'll pick that up, Chair. That's obviously not not going to be a, a component of the application, so I'll just pick that up. I presume that's an, an error in the mapping, but I'll take that away, Chair. Thanks for that. OK, Councillor Muirhead. Yeah, just to be clear on the question that Councillor McKenzie asked about the um, the broadband connections, and you, you, you reiterated the fact that we insist on broadband connection we actually am i right in saying we actually insist on fiber optics to yes. the premises that is our, our conditions yes. now here in midlothian so you're getting the fastest broadband um obviously subject to the other facilities that's needed with that um but we we certainly as as, as russell said there the laying cables in anyway there is well to lay the fiber optics than um the, than the old copper cables so that's the position at the moment well, but thanks, Councillor Mayhead, for reminding me. Yeah, I should have said to the house. Ah. Uh, it's not to the cabinet, it's actually to the house. Mm -hmm. uh, so you can be re rest assured that subject 
as Councillor Muirhead says, subject to everything else working in the telephone exchange, then you might get super fast broadband uh, to the house. But uh, it is part of a planning condition, Councillor McKenzie. Thank you. OK, all right, moving on. Item 5.5 five has been withdrawn, so we go to 5.6, a live application. Peter, I'm taking that as read and I'm going to put it to uh, questions by uh, that anybody may happen to have. Oh, so I should have said Councillor Smell has has left the left the meeting. Okay, is there any questions on this particular application? Oops. Councillor Hackett, then Councillor Muirhead. Thank you, Chair. Um, I have, do have some concerns about the impact um, on what is already a difficult five-way junction and I'm just wondering what could be done um, as part of this application to make improvements to that junction. It's a, a long-standing issue and I believe there's restrictions due to the gas pipeline that, that crosses near there but I'm, I was wondering if uh, perhaps Mr Andorf could um, maybe offer a contribution as to what might be available to this committee in terms of uh, condition on this application. Thank you. OK, I'll take as you ahead and then I'll, I'll bring in Peter. Right, Chair, sorry, I wasn't expecting that again. Um, right, the, I had similar concern. I was going to ask about that, that, that junction, that five way uh, kind of junction and what, what would maybe mitigate some of the issues with that. But also, I'm going to go back to a point I made on the previous item, in this uh, paper here, it talks about um, those that had consult had been consulted and made comments, and I'm struggling to find the exact bit, but it says along the lines that Midlothian Health uh, Social Care Partnership offered no comments on the current application. Now, what I want to try to understand is, did they make no comments, i.e. did they not respond, or did they comment to say that they had no problems with this application? Because obviously, once again, it's going to have an impact on what is already a busy doctor's surgery. And I, I, I never understand how we, that, that quite often seems to be the case, that the Health and Social Care Partnership do not make a comment about a, an application. And, and, and as I say, I'm just wanting some clarification as to whether they commented in the, the positive and said, you know, we're, we're OK with it, we can accommodate it, or whether they just didn't comment at all, because I think they need to get more into uh, this issue uh, when planning applications come up, because I understand what Peter's saying about, uh, you know, we can ask for developer contributions towards the capital for putting in a doctor's surgery, but we can't um, we, we can uh, make contributions towards getting GPs. But the fact is, if, if we if we didn't do something about this in the longer term and we just cannot get GPs, we kind of just keep expanding our communities knowing that there is a problem with the healthcare in that community. So, you know, I, I, I think this is something that I'd, I'd just like to get a bit of clarity on. Thanks, Chair. No, oh, thanks, Councillor. I'll bring Councillor Parry in before I bring you in, Peter, and then that'll clear the hands. Thanks, Chair. Um, yeah, my um, kind of it's more a comment uh, rather than a question, if you like, it's just around um, site access. Um, so I had previously had some um, complaints around work um, near this site before. Um, and the issue is really um, not to the planning conditions, which I see there is planning conditions attached around um, visiting the site, but it's actually enforcement because what we sometimes find is it's once um, a site starts to get itself underway that we get complaints from residents saying you know there's trucks in at school time and such like as well um, I noticed that there was a traffic survey done however it was done between the hours of 7.35 and 8.15 a.m so that really wouldn't have picked up any of the um, school traffic so um, Peter I wonder if you had noticed that as well and if you thought that that was a problem um, in terms of the timings that that had been done um, and just any other advice we can give around not just the planning conditions, but how we enforce it. Because what I tend to find is it takes up, you know, a lot of um, planning officers' time, um, kind of trying to deal with site issues. Um, so really good site management um, on this would be helpful. Over to you, Chair. Thank you very much, Councillor Parry. Peter, to cover these three points. 
Thank you, Chair. If I, if I just pick up the, I won't necessarily do them in order, but if I just pick up the terminology one in terms of the consultation responses, yeah, when we use phraseology offered no comments, that means they haven't responded. So they haven't responded and said we have no comments. If they responded and said we have no comments, then we would usually put the language they've not objected. So we've we've had a response. So so that's the just to clarify in the language and. Following on from that point, it is quite common that we don't get comments from the partnership. We do get occasional comments, but often uh, not, not that many. And it often depends on the size of development. So if a development's into the hundreds of units, then you're likely to get a response. But although this is for 46 units, that's maybe seen as a small scale development, so you won't get the, you won't get the comment. In terms of the transportation and traffic issues, I mean, obviously the, the traffic survey and the road issues are identified in the report. They're discussed in sections 8.11 to 8.14. And there's a number of things here in that the, the applicant started off when they did do a traffic statement. So they've done a number of crunching exercise, which we have consulted Transport Scotland, because obviously the A68 is a, a trunk road, and we've obviously consulted internally as well. And the applicants, uh, specialists, along with Transport Scotland and our own specialists, feel that the volume of, of housing coming forward here can be accommodated within the existing infrastructure, transport uh, junction infrastructure. I, I think it's a fair point to say about the times in terms of the survey. I think on practice, the, the, the hours they've used have been the peak work hours. So you've got the peak people coming and back and forth to to work. If you build, build the schooling, that must probably just compensates for for balancing off of of the work traffic. But the numbers that they've identified, and I've just scribbled a note to myself here about even at the PM peak, they've gone up to 34 movements per hour. You know, that's roughly one movement every two minutes. So it's difficult to argue that that is a significant additional impact on any junction by that 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 volume if there's a sort of continual almost drip 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 effect because you've got multiple developments coming out onto the junction then eventually you get to a point where an assessment says that this is now at capacity but of course we haven't got to that point yet so in terms of the, the officers we're comfortable but this level of development which is relatively small at 46 units is uh, can be sufficiently accommodated it of course was also on an allocated housing site. So of course, when that went through the local plan process, transportation and Transport Scotland would have looked at that at a sort of more strategic level as well. So that, that sort of passed that hurdle as well. When the school was built, they relocated what was already an existing access point back into this, this site. They repositioned that. So, and they actually built that as a quite substantial access point above and beyond what you would normally construct for an agricultural field or, or green field but that was built knowing at some point there would be this housing development be behind the school and if you look at the, the plans for the housing development they just actually lock into that existing access they don't rebuild the access they just lock into the existing access so the conclusion of that chair is that obviously from our point of view we are comfortable with the, the relationship between the scale development and the access and the road infrastructure um, obviously there's a, a Jim Gilfillan's here with the transportation expertise as well if, if additional comments or clarification are required on that matter fine and about, what about site management yeah sorry sorry chair yeah it's um, it's a difficult one because we have a reactive planning enforcement service, which means we're not proactively sat monitoring sites. So we do rely on local residents and others to obviously make complaints to us if there are particular issues. The starting point with any development site is that it's obviously the, the house builder's responsibility to manage that site effectively and safely. When they deviate from that, the council as the regulator authority can take enforcement action if there are breaches of, of planning control or other, other breaches of other regulatory uh, bodies. There is a condition 
about a construction management plan, which includes managing on-site activity, the traffic management in particular, because obviously during the, the, the school hours, so that's looking to, to make sure that the construction deliveries are coming and going out with those school opening and closing times, so it's not getting uh, caught up with the, the school traffic um, chair. But if we do receive complaints, then we will investigate them and look to to, to resolve any breaches of planning control. I appreciate sometimes in the communities concerns are raised about site management which are out with the control of the, the planning authority and are often just the the inconvenience of a construction site. You know, in granting planning permission, there's always going to be a level of activity and noise with a construction site and you can't totally mitigate against that. And that's just a, a, a cost of, of development, I'm, I'm afraid. But we do do our best to to like I say, resolve any breaches. OK, thanks very much. Councillor Curran and then Councillor Hackett. Thanks, Chair. Just, Peter, just on, um, I see on page 107 there is an issue, there, there's a, a line there about dust management plan strategy. Just to reinforce that, this is next to a primary school and um, I'd be keen to see some dust suppression systems in there so we keep the air quality as good as we possibly can for the kids. And also, is there any fuel wash system for uh, site traffic? I'll hold, uh, hold on just now, Peter. I'll, I'll bring I'll bring in Councillor Hackett first, and then I'll bring you in to, to cover both, no doubt, both questions. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I noticed in the section seventy five um, part of the paper, there's mention there of um, play equipment. Uh, having a look at the site, I noticed there's a sort of open plan, but um, would there be a possibility of a contribution being made to the facilities at Calendar Park, given the walking? It's a reasonable walking distance from this site to what already exists in the community rather than creating something um, smaller. And just on the back of some of the comments around the traffic management, if the developers listening, I'd maybe suggest if this application goes ahead that they make a good contact with the school and that would allow parents and others, if you like, to report directly to the developer rather than having to do that through the council all the time, um, albeit that opportunity would always be there for residents. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Thanks for that, because I get there. Uh, Peter? Yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, just to, to, there is obviously a, a, the Conditioned End 10 picks up the construction management program. That does include management of dust and a uh, component about stopping uh, mud and debris going out into the public highway. So that bit, bit is covered. It's also worth interesting, Chair, just in the layout. When the, the case officer were discussing the layout with the developer, it purposely put a landscape, an open space buffer between the the houses and the primary school. So they so there was a we've sort of purposely put in a, a little bit of separation there, which will help obviously not just when the site's built, but during the construction process as, as well. I think the, the point raised about liaison with the school directly is, is a really good one, Chair, and we'll, we'll definitely take that forward and uh, recommend that the developers in the school have that relationship. The other point about the developer contributions, um, yeah, Chair, that's towards off-site provision as well. It's, it's always worth considering when you have a smaller residential scheme, you're you're almost better off having a, a centralised open space with other areas. So there are it's not not just so you get the benefits of economy of size, but it just actually helps children integrate into communities rather than just staying within their own residential area. So so yeah, the, the contributions towards that wider open space player provision. Chair. Okay, th thanks for that, Peter. Councillor Hackett. My apologies again, Chair. A question That's for right. Mr. Gilfillan, if I may. How has the assessment of this junction differed to other junctions? I mean, it's quite unique in my experience of driving around. It's it's a difficult, and I can understand sometimes I come out of there and I'm straight out. Others, I'm stuck there for 15, 20 minutes. So I'm just wondering, given the nature of that junction, um, how how different is that assessed? Thank you. Thanks. Jim Gilfillan, if you're there, could you comment on that, please? Uh, yes, thank you. Um, the starting point is that the junction is a trunk road junction. It's owned and maintained by Transport Scotland, and they have their own road safety team and their own maintenance structure. And I understand that in the past they've been looking at this junction to see what could be done from a road safety point of view and have yet to bring forward any proposals for it. They were consulted as part of this proposal, but they haven't made any recommendations for improvements or changes to it. So they're quite happy that the level of traffic this development would generate 
can be accommodated on that existing junction. And we accept their view, we note their view and accept it. OK, right, thanks for that. It's, Councillor Hackett's obviously trying to get somebody up his campaign for the ID68 bypass, but we'll, we'll, we'll just stick, we'll put that one <laughs> on, a, 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 we'll put that one sticking to the wall at the moment and uh, good, good luck with that one. It's been, it's been years and years and years of campaigning and nothing happening yet. OK, folks, uh, taking that hilarity out of it, um, uh, we've got a planning application in front of us. It's recommended for approval. Uh, is that agreed? With the the conditions that are that are in the in in the plan, is that agreed? Great. Okay. Right. Thanks very much indeed. That being the last item on the agenda, uh, been no private reports. The date of the next meeting is the fifteenth of June, and thank you very much for your attention, attendance, and contributions. And I now declare the meeting closed. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.